Hello, I'm Bryony Harris at Quant Minds International in Lisbon. I'm joined now by Michael Steliaros, uh, Global Head of Quantitative Execution Services at Goldman Sachs. Could you just start by telling us, in your experience, what makes a really successful beta strategy? No, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, there's been a quite a sort of significant proliferation of beta strategies in the last, uh, let's say, five to ten years. Uh, what I'd like to call smart beta strategies is, is uh, the new 40-year-old idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's been an idea that's been around in the quant community for many decades. Uh, there is a lot of research and development into what beta is, and that's uh, a quite significant effort from the asset management community and the sell side recently. Uh, but I think the very significant point here is that the focus has to be on the portfolio construction methodology, mm -hmm. the tradability, the investability of these strategies, going beyond just the identification of what is a, a good value signal or a momentum signal. What we've seen with this exponential growth of assets tracking these types of strategies is that it's becoming harder and harder to actually capture that outperformance because of the capacity of the strategies, because of the way that they're traded, and that is where the focus lies uh, at the moment. So how do I mix and match different smart beta indices? How do they tie into the overarching uh, sort of investment philosophy? How do they mix and match with other investments that the asset owner uh, may hold? So the portfolio construction methodology is at least as important as the choice of the beta signal mm -hmm. that one may uh, deploy. Uh, going beyond that, I mean, we have about six, seven hundred billion dollars of um, assets in terms of listed products that track these types of uh, strategies, and that is a fraction of what the pensions, the sovereign wealth funds in the world already have as their own uh, investments that are beyond the listed products that are out there. This gives rise to fears around crowding. Uh, how many assets are tracking the strategies, how quickly are they rebalanced, what impact would that have uh, in the marketplace. So this uh, sort of extra attention to how we construct these portfolios and even just as importantly how we trade them uh, is a very significant factor uh, beyond the original ideas of having risk premia. Uh, being investment uh, sort of vehicles that would outperform a broad benchmark. Mm. And how have the MIFID II regulations impacted on trading and other aspects of the business? So MIFID II has been a, an eye-opening experience mm. both for the sell side and the buy side. Uh, it's a, from our perspective it's a very good uh, sort of uh, development in that trading and research have been unbundled so mm -hmm. the reason for trading has to be tied into best execution requirements so it is not anymore the case that because there is a good relationship between a buy side institution and a sell side institution a lot of trading is directed towards that it has to be substantiated it has to be data driven it has to be that we're doing the best for our clients from an execution perspective irrespective of research payments or relationships around other aspects of the business. So that has been a quite sort of significant shift in the European environment, but we see it trickling over to the other regions. So many mm. firms that are global in nature and have operations in Europe have to adhere to the MIFI II rules mm. and we see them adopting those across the globe. So mm. irrespective of the fact that in Asia or in the US you are not subject to MIFI II, the, the buy side community has found this example of Europe uh, quite a, a, a significant one in terms of reshaping their operations uh, according to those rules uh, around the globe. Uh, the other bit is that the, the demand both on the sell side and the buy side in terms of collecting data, uh, assessing this quality of execution are quite significant. This has uh, driven up costs but the, the eventual outcome will be better sort of trading and better execution for the underlying asset owner, the, the retail investor, the, the sort of uh, whole community. 
And what benefits do you think algo trading can bring to the quant uh, community? That's again very tied into that entire sort of ecosystem that is developing right now in that we have to be much smarter, flexible uh, in terms of our execution and the quant community, I mean, trading as a percent of alpha or as a percent of mm -hmm. performance is, uh, is a very significant part. Mm. Uh, for a fundamental investor that takes a five-year view on a stock, uh, it may not be as important in terms of what the cost of trading is today or in the next few minutes, but for the quant community with high, have much higher turnover, with a wide breadth of stocks that they uh, need to invest in, every basis point counts. So again, tied up to my feet in terms of having to prove best X and the fact that the cost of trading has significantly increased, uh, that makes algorithmic trading, uh, puts it in the forefront of uh, the, the investment process. Michael Steliaros, thank you. Thank you very much for having me.